Well, uh, I want to open with prayer, but if you brought your Bible or your smartphone or whatever, uh, if you'll turn to 1 Peter, uh, I'm going to pray and then we'll read a passage that will get us started this morning. Lord, we love you. We thank you, God, that we had the opportunity to talk about your church, uh, your bride. And Lord, we just thank you for all that uh, you do. And I pray for every church that is represented in this group, that, Lord, your hand would be upon them, that, Lord, you would give wisdom or direction to them as we talk today, that you confirm things that you've already been speaking to them. Uh, through this time and that you where, wherever there's been uh, they, they've been in a conundrum trying to figure out how to resolve an issue uh, Holy Spirit would you just supply what they need today uh, in this session in Jesus name Amen 1st Peter 5 and verse 1 says the elders who are among you I exhort I who am a fellow elder and witness of the suffering of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion but willingly, not for dishonest gain but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. For all the years that I've, I've been in church leadership uh, and, and vocational ministry, this passage has guided sort of the approach to everything that we have done. And, and I don't think it's a misrepresentation to say that for those of us that are in vocational ministry, we will give an account for the way that we have shepherded God's people. And, and because of that, it, it speaks to the fact that the le our leadership, our position of, of management, or it's a fiduciary position uh, being ultimately responsible to God himself. We, we minister to, care for, give direction. We, we shepherd the, the people that come into our church and we will give account for the way that we have done that because God is the one who owns the church or it, it's his flock, it's not ours. Right. And so uh, when we talk about church governance, we're really talking about the systems or the processes that help make sure that we stay on track to run the church, lead the church, guide the church in a way that pleases God. How do, how do we do that? Uh, in, I, I've been in both churches that I've been involved in, I've been involved with the churches from the very beginning. So literally when they started in somebody's house, both churches. And so, you know, we, it's easy or you can think of the, the systems of governance that become extremely necessary as the church begins to grow. And you say, well, you know, we, we didn't have to think about that when we were small. Well, it may have been more organically expressed when you were small but you should have thought about it. In fact, the systems when you're small that, that are the foundation for what happens in the church, those become the things that the, the structure is built on as it grows. And uh, so a place that I wanna, wanna start is to say, it's been my experience that most churches start not out of submission to God and, and out of a response that sa says, somebody independent acknowledged there's a call on your life and has laid hands on you and sent you to begin this church. But most churches, most pastors uh, respond, uh, start their church or respond out of a response to something. So either they, they were in a, a church that had a dominant leader and they were abused by, by that dominant leader or controlled by that dominant leader and they leave and say, that will never happen to me again. I will, I'll never be controlled or dominated by somebody else. I'm gonna go out here and start my own church and do my own thing and nobody's gonna control me. Or if it wasn't that, you, you've got a group of people that came together and they loved each other and were serving each other as it began 
and, and it became controlling as a group. You couldn't do anything unless the group agreed, and a singular leader was then mistreated by the group, saying, we don't, we're not following you, and you don't tell us what to do, we tell you what to do, and that person leaves and says, nobody's gonna do that to me. And because of those extremes, we can't come to a place of balanced systems designed to lead us to the place of saying, God, what do you want for your church? God, how do we deal with these issues that relate to your, your church? And so there's two foundation principles that are a part of this. And I, I, I started with the explanation I just gave just to say, I'm not pointing fingers today at, at a system. If you don't have a, a, a system of government like I'm gonna talk about, I'm not pointing a finger to say you're wrong, you're in error or sin. I, I don't think the Bible gives that, that degree of clarity to be able to, to say that. In reality, I think that just about any system of government will work as long as there's a genuine love for God and a genuine love for people that are a, a part of it. It, it. Where it breaks down, apart from these systems, let me say this, what I've experienced in church leadership, it can still break down. But when it breaks down, does it have the protective mechanisms to make sure that it operates out of and continues to function out of a, a question, God, what do you want even in the midst of this broken situation? And so, uh, so there's two, two concepts that are sort of the bedrock principles of this. And the first is theocratic rule. When, when we, we use the term theocratic rule, we simply mean it's, it's God's church. It's theos, it's God's government, it's God's uh, uh, flock that we are managing, and we are his under shepherds. And so we want to know, God, what do you want us to do? How do you want us to lead? What is your vision uh, for us? Theocratic rule acknowledges that God has established all governing institutions and has delegated authority in those institutions on earth. So there's the institution of government, there's the institution of family, and there's the institution of the church. When, when we talk about the authority of the church, it's not an all-encompassing authority. We, when, when a person becomes a member of the church, we acknowledge that we, God has vested within the church the, the, and we believe that when a person joins the church, they are, they are saying to us as elders and pastors, we are coming to place our spiritual well-being under your influence or under your leadership. It's, it's ultimately God who's doing it, but we believe God has brought us here for you to help develop us. And so we take it with that level of responsibility as reflected by 1 Peter chapter 5. Uh, it, it, let me again emphasize that all the governing institutions, I believe, are established by God and need to be ex uh, respected. So if I were to draw these in, in circles, sort of like the Olympic rings, there's overlap in some of, some of these, but there's, there's autonomy, there's authority that they have apart from themselves. So I believe the government has authority to uh, care for us as a, uh, as a, uh, uh, a, a nationality of people, uh, provide responsibilities, and we need to respect and pray for our governing authorities. The, the family has authority, and it needs to be respected and, and uh, empowered to lead uh, in that role, and so does the church. Um, so these forms of government that I mentioned, uh, if, if you're a part of a church that is basically a one-man rule or one-man led, uh, that I, I realize uh, we talk about this in terms of there can be shadow government in that when you talk about it, there's some structure that's in place, but in reality, one, one guy makes all the calls. Uh, it's an oligarchical, it, it's, if it's not one man, it's, uh, it's control that's held in the, in the hands of just a few, and they lead and everyone else follows. And again, will that government work? Yes, 
if the people that are involved love God and love each other. But when it breaks down, there's not a system in place that, that uh, takes care of the brokenness and leads the church. And so what happens is in the brokenness of a system like that, there's devastation that happens in people's lives. The other side is this uh, committee rule, uh, congregational uh, setup. And again, uh, it, it'll work. It'll, it, you know, we, we love each other, we love God, we're trying to figure out uh, in our committees how to best to manage and operate things. But without a balance between these two, there needs to be a singular head, there needs to be a, a plurality of leaders and if you, if you follow to either one of those extremes, there's weaknesses in both of those areas. So the theocratic rule is the first concept that we believe in, um, and, and we encourage to stay, uh, to avoid the extremes of that singular rule and uh, the group control. The second one is what we would call the balance between singular headship and a plurality of, of leadership. Uh, singular, uh, this singular headship, by singular headship, I don't mean singular control as in the oligarchy. I mean a, a belief that according to a biblical pattern, God calls and anoints an individual and gives a primary, the, the primary vision for the, the, the congregation that is established to a singular person. It's not, it's not rule by committee, it's not vision cut by committee, it's one person, and then that one person God surrounds with a group of people to help them uh, flesh out the vision and, and uh, develop and impart the vision uh, as, it, as it moves forward. We call it singular headship with plurality of leadership. This balanced structure provides a singular recognized God-appointed head that is surrounded and undergirded by a unified team of gifted leaders to support God's vision through him and who assist in implementing the vision and direction that's re revealed by God. Uh, this singular headship with a plurality of leadership, we find it in the Old Testament with Moses. Uh, and when Jethro comes to him and says, what are you doing, Moses? This is too much for you. All the people are coming to you. It was a singular headship that was leading two million people out of Egypt uh, toward the promised land. He said, you need to set uh, a rule. You need to appoint other leaders to carry this load, to shoulder this load with you uh, as a part of this. So it was singular head with a plurality of leadership uh, that surrounded them. I believe the Godhead is set up exactly the same way. A singular head, God the Father, with a plurality of leader, the Father and the Holy, I mean the Son and the Holy Spirit, that come together in unify, in, in unity to lead forward the direction uh, of the Godhead. Uh, Jesus and the disciples, another example, New Testament. Uh, Jesus was singularly God's appointed leader and head, and Jesus invested himself, surrounded himself with 12, 12 primary leaders. Uh, with which he poured himself in, uh, into them and uh, ministered with and through them. Uh, Peter and James leading the Jerusalem church in, in Acts chapter 15, Sim similar situation. Uh, Titus, uh, Paul told him in Titus chapter one, I, I, the reason I want you, I left you here is that you might appoint elders in every church. It was a, a singular movement, singular head, uh, acting to, to build a plurality of leaders uh, within the church. Uh, just think for a minute the amount of effort, just go back to, to Moses and the children of Israel, the amount of organizational effort it, it took to lead three million people uh, a, across a desert wilderness for 40 years and in in an attempt to try and hear, believe, and obey God. The whole story of, of the Old Testament is the effort that was made to try and get people to hear, believe, and obey God as, as a part of this process. It's, it, it's still, it's one of the, the greatest things I think that we as 
as pastors and vocational ministers struggle with is this idea of how do we press in to hear what God is saying and to ensure that we are following uh, as obediently as we can what we hear him uh, saying to us. Singular headship refers to the primary person whom God has appointed and has revealed the vision, values, and direction of the work. Sometimes when we talk about this, uh, it confuses people because they say, well, that person's the only person that can get vision then? Uh, does a singular head mean that there's only one person that get, gets vision? Because I feel like I'm visionary. And I'm saying that about myself, but you may be saying that about yourself. So, like, what do you mean the primary person? Well, uh, there's several examples that I can give you in this, uh, but I, I think that the church doesn't come into its fullest unified form when it's built on individual, uh, a collection of individual visionary efforts. <clears throat> Where, I don't know if, if you'd be familiar, my, and when I was growing up, we used to, my mom used to make this thing she called pull apart bread. It would be in a butt pan, and she would take bits of dough, and, and balls of dough, and she would collect them, you know, put them in uh, cinnamon and butter and stuff, and then she'd, she'd put them together in this pan and, and bake it, and when it would come out, it would come out like a cake, but you could pull it individually apart by the balls that were there. Well, I think that's what happens when we look at somebody and say, hey, you got a vision for youth? Hey, come, come over here. You, you got a vision wow. for outreach? Come, come over here. You, you, you got a vision for worship? Come over here. And we, we connect, we build this pull apart organization mm. that is not unified under a, a person that says, I have a vision for this in worship. Is that similar to what you feel? Would you come and help me build that? Yeah. I have a vision to reach this next generation of, of young people, and it's gonna, it, it's gonna take on the, the idea, we're gonna do these kind of things. Does that stir something in your heart? Will you come and help me build that? That's entirely different than a pull apart organization. That's a unified organization under one visionary leader. Does that make sense? Yeah. And uh, so let me, let me just tell you, I think the most damaging things that can happen, and it's, it's easy to do, is to, out of love for somebody, uh, out of a desire to connect somebody, if you say, well, I don't know if I have a vision for that or not. You're the primary leader, but you really want this guy. You, you recognize that, the, that he or she is very gifted, and you bring them in and attach them to the outside of your vision, thinking that it, it's connected. So. Uh, when I was at Trinity, before I came to Trinity, or before uh, the church started, before I left business, I was in business and I was thinking one day, if I weren't doing business, if I weren't working for my dad, uh, selling uh, wholesale uh, paper, uh, what would I want to do? And I was playing racquetball nearly every day. I, I played tournament racquetball and uh, I just liked the game. And this was before the days of Gold's Gym or 24-Hour Fitness or what we have today. Um, there just wasn't many of those around. You could go to the YMCA and play racquetball, but there were very few racquetball clubs at the time that I was thinking about this. And I thought, I'm going to put, put together a racquet club. So I, I, I put together a business plan to build my, my own racquet club, and it was going to be Christian-based. The name of it was going to be King's Court because the king was going to be resident in that place. Ten racquetball courts, two, two glass uh, tournament courts with an indoor running track and weight facilities. And uh, I got my business plan all put together, got SBA financing arranged. And a guy that I played racquetball with said, would, would you be interested in uh, talking? We want to build a racquet club. Would you be interested in talking to us? And I said, well, sure. And he said, would you consider selling your deal? And I said, um, maybe. So I took my, my business plan, I presented it to him and his partner, and uh, when I got done presenting it, his partner looked at my friend who had contacted me and said, uh, he, he said to me, how much do you want it? What for it? So I quoted him a number and he looked at my friend and said, write him a check. 
I went, shoot, didn't ask enough. <laughs> and I, I walked out of there having sold the, my business plan. And then it wasn't long after that that I was approached by the church and I came on staff uh, to be the business administrator. Well, a couple of years into being in the business administrator, uh, we, we took a, a retreat uh, in Colorado for our men. And so I had gone up to this retreat with my best friend and co-pastor in the church, Jimmy Evans, and we were rooming together. And just before leaving on the retreat, I had heard that the, my friend who built the club and was operating it, that they'd gotten into some financial trouble and that it may be, they may be needing to sell. So we go into this men's retreat and at the retreat, we were asked to go through an exercise of hearing God. And so uh, I, in the session, I, I started focusing in on this racket club and I felt like God was saying, you know, what the, the vision that I gave you for this club is, is a vision that came from me and now it's gonna come first full circle and it's gonna be a part of the church. And it'll be the family life center of the church. And I, I mean, I fleshed this vision out grandly uh, as I was writing. And so after the session, went back to the room and Jimmy was in the room and <clears throat> so I said, hey Jimmy, what what the Lord said to you? And so he read to me what the Lord said to him. And I said, that's awesome. I Yes, I believe that. That is that is definitely God's vision. And he said, well, what did he say to you? And so I unpacked what the Lord said to me. And, and when I got done, he said, that's not God, Tom. <laughs> I said, yours was God. You're supposed to say mine was God. And I, I didn't think of it this way, but what was, what was happening is the equivalent of, I was trying to attach a pull apart to the vision of the church. Yeah. And he said, no, no, I'm, I'm, maybe, I'm not saying it's not valid. Maybe, maybe this is what God wants for you. It's just not a part of the church. It's not, it's not a part of the what I see, the direction I see for the church. He was the senior pastor. And, uh, and I, when I look back on that, I'm so thankful that out of our friendship, he didn't feel pressured or, or compromised and say, well, you know, you're my best, but well, let's, let's see if we can make that work. It wasn't a part of his heart, which I believe ultimately is a part of the reflection of God working through him in that, uh, that scenario. So over the years, what I've come to describe in things like this is, is uh, it, when people, new members or people join our staff, uh, in, in a position, I say, what you'll, one of two things will happen uh, for you. Either Gateway will be the greatest place you've ever worked. You'll just think it's phenomenal. Or it'll be the most brutal that you've ever experienced. And they look at me kind of funny. And, and I, I said, what will make the difference is whether or not you embrace our vision and make it your own, or whether you, and, you try and, and insert your vision into our vision. It, it, we will treat it like a foreign agent in the body. We'll, we'll surround it, isolate it, and, and try and eliminate it because we believe that that's counterproductive to what God, the way God would introduce things. We, we, we do have uh, a process uh, that, you know, people can say, hey, have we ever thought about it? Could we, could we pray about it? Sure, we can do that. That's, that's part of pursuing God, but until there's a legitimate expression, and the legitimate expression would be, it, it gets formed in the heart of the senior pastor. And then the, the, as the senior pastor then begins to express it, the plurality of leaders around him confirms it. It's not a part of our vision. And so this uh, singular headship with plurality of leadership is a, a, a really big deal that provides the balance of structure within our organization. Uh, we, uh, when, I, when I came to Gateway, uh, I'd been a part of, uh, from a distance, I was still in Amarillo for the first three years, I was just a, a translocal elder helping, helping Robert from a distance. And um, so when I moved down to be a part of the staff, the first thing I did is I said, do you have a written vision? 
And he said, uh, yeah. And it was like three pages. So I took what he had in three pages and I began to write paragraphs of two or three sentence paragraphs of things that not, not, would not be so directive, but would, you know, uh, in worship, this is the kind of worship atmosphere or expression uh, that I think I've heard you say. And then, and then I turned three pages into about 15 pages, and then I went back to him and say, now, will you read through this with me? Does this express what, what you believe the church is to be? And, uh, and he said, uh, he, we, he would change words or change the, the direction, and we came, came up with a document that expressed what he uh, felt in every area of ministry, children, youth, uh, things that we didn't exist. Do we, do we want to have a TV ministry? Do you believe uh, he had, had been working with James Robinson and TV ministry? Is that a part of your heart to have that? Yes. That, what about a Christian school? Are we going to have a Christian school? Well, yeah, I, that's part of my heart. I think we'll do, you know. What, what about uh, a family life center related to the church? You know, I think there's so many good things that they can do other than that, and I don't want to pull them into the church. That's really not a part of my heart. Okay. You know, so we would, we would flesh, we, we would identify what I would call the skeletal structure of the vision. I believe the senior leader uh, establishes the skeletal structure of the vision. Then we took what was written and we took it to the elder body and the elders then read through every line of the vision and we talk through, well, if we're going to have a TV ministry, what might the TV ministry look like? You know, when, how will we know when we're supposed to start the TV ministry? If we're going to have a Christian school, what kind of, how big will the school be? And what kind of things? We, we fleshed out the vision in the discussion among the, the elders as a plurality of leaders. Does that make sense? So it's, it is a very uh, balanced model and I'll just give you a couple of examples. So we wrote in the original vision that we, we, have, a, we, we have a vision to, be, uh, to preach the gospel, to take the message of the church uh, in television. And the conversation went, so when are we going to do that? And Robert said, I don't know. I think God will tell us about it. He'll, it there'll be some catalyst event that'll, may, it, right now, I don't, it's not in my heart to do right now, but if I look long distance, and if that's what the vision is to be, is to be a long distance look, I, I do see that on the horizon. I just don't know when. I don't know how much time. So a uh, number of years went by, and um, I really hadn't even thought about TV ministry. We were doing so many other things. And we get a call from a guy uh, who was a part of the church, who is a part of Daystar, uh, the Daystar Television Network. Uh, do y'all get that in your area? And he said, "Hey, we we have a uh, we have a prime time available, and we want to give it to you. Have you guys ever thought about being on TV?" And uh, so he contacted Robert. So then Robert brought it back to the elders, and that initiated the conversations that launched us in into television. Uh, it was a, there was a catalyst moment. It was a part of the vision, you know, in, a, in conceptual form that then got launched in a catalyst moment that, that took elder discussion uh, to bring about. Uh, when, when the elders discussed it, it was like, well, we don't want, if we're going to do television, let's don't do television where we spend, on a, in a 30-minute program, we spend 15 minutes or 10 minutes of the program and uh, we're asking for money. Let's teach. And if we, if God doesn't provide in a, in a way other than that, then let's don't do television. And we all agree that that's right. So uh, if you've ever seen our, uh, our television show, we will offer resources that support what is being taught, but we don't fundraise. And it's amazing what God does in providing for the airtime of the, the program. It, but it came out of the discussion of the plurality of leaders and the unity that was expressed as a part of, of, of that discussion. Um, I, I, I was telling some before I started, I have 15 grandchildren. 
And when my, my oldest grandchild now is graduating from high school, and when she was five or six years old, my son, who was a part of the church, and my daughter, who has three boys uh, with her family, their kids were starting to come into grade school, and they were saying, Dad, are we going to do a Christian school? I mean, come on. We, it's time. We, we need it. And uh, so one, one day in my oversight, I said, uh, Pastor, are you, you know, we, it's part of our vision to do a Christian school. Do you think now uh, is the time? And he said, no. Are you sure? I mean, you know, could, couldn't my kids serve as a catalyst event here uh, uh, to do it? We still don't have a Christian school. And I don't know if we ever will. It was a part of the long range vision uh, aspect, but there's just not been a, there's not been a God said that's, that's launched that, uh, that, that need. And uh, just let me say it this way. There were others other than my own grandkids, but uh, a need does not necessarily uh, serve as the catalyst mm -hmm. for the, the expression, the launch of a visionary need. It, it has to be a catalyst that is a, a God-directed uh, event. So these two foundations, the fo foundation of theocratic rule of God, it's your church. We simply want to steward it on your behalf teach us, show us, help us hear and know how you do that. And then a structure that is a, a balance between singular headship and plurality of leadership. Uh, our elder body, uh, to, to sort of reinforce this structure, uh, we, uh, our senior pastor is the chief executive officer of the organization. He's, so he's, he's the head. Uh, what I say to people on our staff is we work for Robert. Uh, and if that causes you a problem, then you probably don't want to work here. You know, it, it, you'll see how, it, how it, it works out. I think Gateway is the most empowering place I've ever worked. Uh, but uh, the, the idea is we, we, we are not independent. We all, have, uh, we, we all have people that we are accountable to, and we have a job description that we fulfill, and we do it to the best of our ability. But... Uh, we, we work uh, for Robert. W Robert, is, so he, he's the CEO of the organization. He's the chairman of our elder board. He's the, in, in every way, he is reflected as the singular head of Gateway Church. Now, uh, in saying that, he's, he doesn't have all authority. He, he's not the singular head in, in that sense of having all authority. So, uh, we say it this way, we are elder governed, senior pastor led, staff and volunteer run, and congregation owned. Uh, elder governed, so the governing responsibility, and he's the chairman of the elders, the governing responsibility is to approve the annual budget, to determine the, the initiatives of the organization from year to year, uh, what, are, what are we going to focus on this year? What do we hear, believe God is saying that we need to uh, give our attention to this year? The, those are the initiatives. Uh, to approve the salary structure. So we have something like 15 categories, job categories. Every category has a high, medium, and uh, low end that the elders approve. The elders uh, approve the control party salaries, that would be Robert's salary, my salary, uh, any of our kids, any el elder that is a staff person, they, they approve those salaries and the, the family members of those people. So th that's what is what we call the control parties. The elders approve that. Um, I said the, the annual budget, they determine spending limits within the categories of the organization um, uh, out of budget spending limits. When they approve the budget, uh, they, they approve whatever has been in the budget to be spent or authorized to be spent by the staff as long as the money's there. And, uh, and then if it's out of budget, they approve the, the limits by category in, in the organization uh, for that. 
if it goes above the spending limits, then so uh, I would have a certain amount of authority, uh, financial authority, and if a decision exceeds my authority, then I can go to Robert and another executive team member, and that would give us a certain amount of financial authority. And beyond that, it has to go to the elder body for uh, additional conversation and approval. Uh, those, that's what we mean by governing. We, we, uh, we would not, if, if Robert feels uh, it's time to initiate, like let's just say he came in uh, this week and said, you know what, I just have this stirring, I think it's time to start a Christian school. The place that that would go is to the elders for discussion. And in that singular headship, plurality of leaders uh, relationship, the uh, sort of the most treasonous thing that you can do, because we do everything in unanimity. Our bylaws state that we make uh, decisions by majority, but uh, the the reality is we we have all agreed that we're going to be in unanimous agreement on any decision, or we're going to table the decision. <laughs> and and the reason is because of several philosophies. Um, we, it's built on the, the philosophy that relationship, our relationship as leaders is more important than the issue that we're addressing. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, we're very passionate in our conversations. They get very lively uh, in, in the approach, but all, one, all, all a person has to do is raise their hand and say, you know, I just am not there, guys. I, I need more time to pray. Okay, you, you got more time to pray. I need more information. Okay, you'll get more information. You're, it's not going to be rammed down anybody's throat in order to, and then we'll say, well, we all agreed on this. And because that's the case, if we're having a conversation and, and the whole group, seem, the conversation seems to be going this way and you don't, you don't feel good about it, so, but you don't say anything. Because it's like, well, I don't know. So you don't raise your hand to say, hey, can we just slow down a minute? I'm not, I'm not quite there yet. But you go outside the meeting and pull two or three people aside and say, you know, did you agree with what we were talking about in there? I mean, I, I wasn't for that, were you? Well, I, yeah, that's all right. And, and you start having a meeting outside the meeting? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's one of the quickest ways to get you removed as an elder. If you're not brave enough or courageous enough to talk about it in the room, you, ca you can't be in the room. Mm -hmm. right. and, and so that's just a treasonous act in our view. Mm -hmm. we, we are committed to do everything by unity, and we will respect your, your position if, if you need more time. We'll give you more time. And that... that Function that functioning while it starts as a uh, as an elder, it works its way out in the in the livelihood of the organization. We have very lively conversation in the organization. It's not quite as we're making decisions in the organization. Sometimes in the organization, the decision is we've decided to do this. The elders have given us this directive. We're going here. Well, we we invite any kind of perspective, uh, honest, open input, but we may head out and ask you to come along in that, from an organizational perspective. Does that make sense? So, okay, so the benefits of singular headship are these. Uh, it creates unity of vision and focus of ministry. It produces high accountability for implementing God's vision without becoming distracted by other interests and good ideas. It empowers the senior pastor and the team of leaders around him to lead with clarity of vision, defined roles of responsibilities, and accountable authority. Now, I didn't do this, but so let me do this real quick. Elder governed, senior pastor led, that's primarily what we're talking about here. The senior pastor is the visionary leader of the church. He establishes the, the leadership direction that then gets affirmed as we move uh, forward. Uh, staff and volunteer run simply means that without the, the, we have a large staff, but in a large church, in any church, you can't do, you can't pay everybody that fulfills 
ministry responsibilities, there's just not enough funds. And so uh, we, we need volunteers. We, we recruit, train, and deploy volunteers in, in ministry. Our staff, the, the uh, early on when the, when the church was small, uh, well, the, the staff wore multiple hats and they did, they, they worked right alongside the volunteers doing the very thing that the volunteers were doing. As the church got bigger, the responsibilities of the staff were to organize, coordinate, oversee, uh, and recruit, train, and deploy. They became more managerial in function uh, as a part of the process. So uh, there, there are, there's organizational development as a part of the process of this. But a singular head, headship empowers the senior pastor and the team around him to lead the organization in the way that it needs to go. The benefits that come with the plurality of leadership is high buy-in uh, with shared ownership of the vision. Uh, even though Robert is the visionary person, you know, I passionately represent the vision of Gateway Church because it's mine. I, I love it. I, 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 uh, I don't feel slighted as if I don't have a voice into the vision because I'm not the one who primarily set the structure of it. Does that make sense? Yeah. It allows input that gives great clarity and definition as it fleshes out the vision uh, of the leader. It ensures that the vision is owned and understood by a broad base of leadership, not just the singular head. When, when you have passionate discussions about things that, how, how are we gonna reach the youth? How are we gonna, how, how are we gonna uh, formulate our children's ministry? What about our worship? How, what are our weekend services like? When, when those conversations come in and are fleshed out, uh, it's interesting. Uh, what Robert represents in those conversations is, is it keeps us from kind of skewing off in a direction. You go, no, whoa, 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 that, that's, not what, that's not what we're about. Oh, yeah, that's right. You know, he, he kind of brings us back into the parameters uh, for the discussion, the healthy discussion uh, to take place. It gives a broad base of support and shared vision for the ministry responsibilities because of plurality of leadership. Now, I'm gonna move off of this just, just a minute, but before I do, is there, anybody have a question? And is, is this clear? Yes. Um, so, um, you, you, the senior leader makes decisions with the other um, governing board, so, Am I right when you say that there's got to be unanimity, unanimity that the pastor just comes from one vote, the senior leader? Correct. Okay. Yep. And uh, now, the reality is it's a very influential vote. Right. You know, he, he, he's a good communicator to begin with. He's passionate in representing his, his vision. But it's... The, the elder body, the plurality, is not made up of yes people who say, well, because he's passionate and because he's articulate, I'm not even going to try and stand up to that. Right. You know, all you have to do, you don't have to be articulate. All you have to do is say, I'm not there yet. I need more time to pray. And we'll stop the process so you have more time to pray. Now, if you become a disruptor, well, then, then the whole group's going to get rally around you and go, what's up, dude? Why, why are you always the foot dragger? <laughs> you, you know. Have you guys known each other a long time too? We have. Well, so the core elders, I've known Robert. Uh, I knew Robert 15 years before the church started. So he was a friend, a ministry friend of mine. Okay. Uh, and m many of the the core, the original elders, uh, were that way. But as we've gotten older, we started incorporating a younger group of elders, and they're. You know, we've, we've known them a few years, but not like that. Right. And, uh, and what's interesting from my sake, I don't think of myself as an old guy, but I guess I am an old, old guy. And some of the younger thinking tweaks me a little bit. It's like, yeah. what? where did you come up with that? Uh. It, you know, but we don't say that. Uh -huh. we, we, we respectfully treat each other's perspective. And, and I might say, I, I need I need you to talk some more because I, I don't understand where you're coming from, you know. But but we we honor and respect each other, and it works 
not because we have this long tenure of relationships, but because we're committed to this process. Yeah. Yes. Super question. So who selects the elders and how or what system do you have in place to safeguard from a pastor selecting an elders of yes men that if he were to get self-centered in his vision, if he has a bunch of yes men, then they essentially license his authority to do a bad vision. Yeah. The elders select the elders. The, we are not congregation nominated. And the elders in our setup are appointed for life. Well, they're appointed until they resign, they move, uh, they, they pass away, or they disqualify themselves. And now, so we're, we're just now, I'm 66, and there's one other elder that's older than I am. Most, I would say, there's a group of elders that are in their 50s, and then we've added a group that are now in their 40s. And we're needing to look at adding some that are in their 30s so that they have long tenure mm -hmm. in this process with, with us. And so uh, we, had not, we have not addressed the idea of uh, sort of mandatory retirement, you know. <laughs> but even though I may be the, one of the, you know, retired out ones, uh, I think that it probably needs to, unless you're going to grow the eldership to uh, some huge number. We have 13 elders, and, uh, and we think that's a good size. So that means somebody's going to have to leave in order for somebody to come in. Um, so the process of selection is this. Uh, on a, uh, usually it's at a retreat. We take two elder retreats a year, one in the spring and one in the fall. Uh, we don't necessarily have to go someplace. We might be, it might be an in-town retreat where we take a couple of days, and, but we're meeting all day or involved, we'll meet in the morning and then in the afternoon we'll do so. we'll go to the ranger game or we'll go play golf or we'll, we'll do some relational bonding activity in the afternoon. Uh, but it, as a part of those meetings, uh, we will say, are there any, any new elder candidates? Uh, it would be Roberts, say if someone resigned and we, we were uh, we needed to fill a position. It would be Robert's place to say, okay, this is an agenda item we're putting on. We need, we need to talk about new elders. If he wanted to expand the number of elders, it would be his to put on the agenda. And then we would discuss, uh, do we need more elders? And, and, and there were a couple of years when we were needing to add elders, and the response of the elders was, there's too much of a unity that we exist right now that we, we just don't feel good messing with that unity. We don't want to add anybody. And so, okay, you know, there's a, there's a mutuality of submission that's a part of the process. When we actually do put names or begin to submit names, anybody can submit a name. Any one of our elders can submit a name. We go around the room, do you have a name? Do you have a name? Do you have a name? And, and we will put an, the name on a, on a board. No discussion, just the name. And, and then, uh, once the names are on the board, sometimes there's two, sometimes there's ten. You know, it, it just depends. Uh, once the names are on the board, then we'll go back and we'll read off the name, and then there's there's discussion. It just takes one elder to say, mm, I'm, I have an issue, and that name is, uh, it. You know, it could be, I, I have an issue. I think that there's some things that are going on in his business, and I don't know that he can give the time. Okay, well, we'll just, we'll eliminate for right now. I, I think that there, it, I think he's a, a great candidate, but might be, uh, might need a little more development in the vision uh, and so on of, of the church. So, okay, we'll delay. And that means it could, he could come up in another discussion of elders, but not right now. So then, once we've read through all the names, if there's not a name, if every name's been crossed through, then we don't have any candidates for the, uh, this season. And, uh, or if one is left, then it initiates a process. And the process would be with the, uh, the, one of our elders would meet with this candidate to say, we've, been, we've discussed you as a potential elder candidate and we would like for you to come and uh, to a, a meeting, to a, uh, a fellowship dinner uh, with a few of us elders and you can ask any questions you want to ask us and uh, we'd 
in, in fairness, we'll probably ask you two or three questions as well. Mm -hmm. You know, just so that we, we want you to know us and we want to get to know you. And it includes a spouse. Uh, because even though uh, in our system, uh, we say there's only two, two places that women uh, can't hold at Gateway, and that's senior pastor or elder. Uh, we, we acknowledge and um, we believe in the, the giftedness of women, uh, for sure. The women can teach men and so on. Women can be uh, campus pastors, associate campus pastors, uh, because they're, they fall under the headship of the senior pastor being we're one church with multiple locations. But um, in, in saying that, our wives have a very influential role in our lives. And uh, we, we, we tell the elders, um, you, you can tell your wife anything that we've talked about. But she needs to know that what we talk about is confidential. So she can't tell her best friend. And if it gets out that we've talked about something in here and it came from one of your wives, it could potentially uh, impact your elder involvement. So you, you determine what, what's good, what, how to process. And then our wives give us a lot of feedback, a lot of input. You know, we're, we're going to be talking about so-and-so. Oh, don't do that. That'd be the, you know, so, so we, we represent our wives. And in our, I mentioned we take two retreats, a spring retreat and a fall retreat. Usually on the fall retreat, our wives are with us. Um, they have dinner with us. We, we meet in the morning. The wives will have some activity to uh, connect them uh, as, as a group. And then uh, at night, we'll, we'll have dinner together and we'll report to them, here's what we've been talking about today, here's what we think, what's your reaction? You know, how do you, we, give us your input. And uh, so they have, they have that opportunity. Does that answer your question about how you control, make sure that the pastor doesn't get yes, yes men? Yeah, they always just like to that we control that yes men. Yep, yep, yes. It, it was a combination. So it, originally when Gateway started, there were three um, o, o, what we called apostolic overseers, translocal overseers. It was me, uh, Jimmy Evans, and Steve Doolin. And uh, so Robert brought a group that he wanted as elders, and we participated in setting those elders in place. So it was not, they were not just independently established. We laid hands on them. Prayed, prayed over them and confirmed that, yeah, these are biblically qualified and relationally qualified. I might, I might say one other thing. When we consider an elder, uh, the, the, we start with biblical qualifications of Timothy and Titus, mm -hmm. uh, but there's a lot of people in our church that meet those qualifications that are not elders. Mm -hmm. and, and so just on a practical basis, what we say is, uh, okay, so you, we're looking for spiritual people people who love God, love the church, who love their family, who, who live out their, their relationship with God in everyday life, you know, we, and we observe that, who have an involvement in the church. So that brings them up on our radar screen, but they need to have chemistry with the existing elders. So if we don't want to go to dinner with them or to, to a movie, why would we bring them into a, a, a working relationship that's going to be for the rest of our lives? And, and so th that's another thing that can, you know, if you're a little quirky, if you're, if you're, I mean, you may be godly, but you're quirky, you know, and, and, and the chemistry doesn't fit, you're, you're going to get rubbed off the board. <laughs> and, uh, and we, we have many godly, capable leaders, m members of our pastoral team that are are elder qualified that do not, do not serve on our elder board. And so it's, it's just a part of the, the, the process of the way that we uh, govern. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so Pastor Lee said something during that last session about um, we don't need more CEOs, you need, we need more shepherds. Yeah. The whole idea of a pastor being a shepherd. It was a very confirming word to me because it's something that I feel like God's been walking me through the last 
18 months. I'm not a CEO, I'm a shepherd. So how do you, and I know you use a lot of that terminology, how do you, how do you kind of manage that tension between, obviously there are some of those business roles that are, you know, responsibilities there. How do you keep that from seeping into the heart of that board? And how do you take a, so we have a board of directors. We don't even use the word elder, it's a board of directors. And it functions like a board of directors. It's very financially based, it's not very spiritually based. Um, how do you transition that to a board of elders in to yeah. keep that heart of shepherding? Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, so at the, at the base of that question, how do we keep, how do we make sure that our elders are shepherding and not corporate minded? Yeah. Uh, when you keep the focus, when part of the, the process of conversation is we're here to seek God and to ask him what he wants and we're by individual and group, we're, we're committed to do whatever God says. So that's the essence of shepherding. You know, if, if we, it's easy to define from a pastoral perspective, uh, shepherding as being uh, taking care of the sheep. But you'll find people that if, if they're asking you for benevolent help and you don't give it to them, uh, they're, they're gonna tell you, you're not taking care of me. You, you didn't help me. And so we have to think, what is the best? What, what would God want for your life, your family, and we don't control them by any means, but we're, we're giving them that level of input. And we would expect that from our, uh, our elder body. So while there's a, a lot of decision, uh, uh, sort of financial, we, we review the budget, uh, we talk about these initiatives, but it's all within the context of what, what God is saying uh, in this. And then our elders are responsible to minister. So we're looking for them to teach, and we're looking, uh, we're looking for uh, ministry opportunities. We get people that call us and say, well, I'm, I'm in the hospital, I've got stage four cancer, can, can the elders come and pray? Yeah, that's, that's a part. Is any among you, James says, sick, let him call for the elders. Well, we, we've, we interpret that and push it down to say, well, the, the, that's the pastoral you know, leader, the shepherding leader, true but there are some some instances where okay our associate pastors have been to pray they've been to to minister we want an elder our elders are are not going to back off of it and say well i just handled the finances you know i just i just organized the ministry no we're we're invested and and praying uh, teaching, leading in, in some area of ministry. And that, that'd be another aspect of it. We're looking, uh, we don't think you'll become spiritual or invested in the ministry by appointing you as an elder. You'll need to be that first. Yeah. Right. And then we'll recognize it. Right. That help? Yes, yes. I'll, I'll come to you just a minute. All right, one of the things that you mentioned was that you have elders that are also on staff. Yes. Um, do you have specific criteria that would allow a person to take both roles? And then also what safeguards do you have in place to make sure that you don't have some kind of abuse of power? Yeah. So uh, we, because we have a mix of staff and non-staff elders, uh, I think the reason, I think it works, and the reason it works is because we've defined the roles. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, as an elder, we're governing, and that's different than your staff role which is a role of implementing. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and then we define the limits of authority related to initiation of new vision and, uh, and budget issues. And so internally in the organization, conversations go like this and say, well, uh, wait a minute, I, I, I think, I don't think we have the authority to do that. I think we need to, uh, we need to get approval from the elders to, to do what we're talking about. So there's that, that give and take uh, within the organization uh, that, uh, uh, that is there. And as a staff person who becomes an elder, you need to really be able to understand it's not us and them, it's us. Mm -hmm. And so you take your staff hat off, you're not representing whatever area of ministry you're serving, you, you are, you're an elder. Mm 
You're representing the ministry and the vision and, and managing that on behalf of, of God. And so when you define clearly, elder governed, senior staff, uh, uh, senior pastor led, staff and volunteer run. So now you're implementing the vision that, that the elders have established. And when you, when you begin implementing and it, it, it carries you to a boundary of something new, do you have the authority to implement that? No, then it, does it need to bump up within the organization or does it need to bump up within the elders? That's the question. And, and uh, we, we are very intentional staff-wise uh, that when we talk about things, we don't talk about it from the perspective of the area we represent. It, you know, you, you're taking off your staff hat, right? So don't, don't be representing, well, the, the youth or the adults or, you know, I'm passionate about this area. They need budget on this. And so I'm going to say no to you unless you say yes to this. Yeah. That, none of that goes on. We're governing for the, the work of the ministry and trying to do what we hear God saying. Yeah. So really, I'm, and just to, just to clarify, from a uh, requirements perspective, it's like 100% chemistry. You don't have any sort of specific... No. No, we, we have, from time to time, uh, we thought, well, we need a balance. We, we need at least three non-staff, uh, just because there is, uh, there is some non-staff on the salary issues. The non-staff guys are a, a subcommittee that deal with non-staff issues, so that there's no, no uh, yeah, uh, conflict of interest, you know, on the staff side. But other than that, it's, it's strictly chemistry. Yep. Yeah. Did you, did you have your hand up before, ma'am? Yeah. No. Okay. Yeah. Was, okay. So um, you were saying, obviously, that you're very selective. Um, is, is there some nepotism attached to that? Healthy nepotism, most likely, just like you were saying, not making sure that you're picking people um, that don't have the DNA or the culture of what you're trying to cultivate. But then also, within the singular level of leadership of plurality, having that balance which is what I believe you're saying Gateway possesses and functions in, yep. um, is there opportunity for the pastor to veto, especially considering that he may have, because he's under apostolic covering or grace, apostolic function. So he may end up feeling like there's a, something that he really feels animate about and say, hey, as much as I appreciate that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use my card for the year on this mm -hmm. choice. And, and nobody get offended because the, he, he genuinely believes he may be heard something or is there that, you know, yeah, you know, you know, you know. well uh yeah he, it wouldn't be as one card for the year it it would it, it, he would have the same authority as any elder as we're we're discussing a name and if he feels like mm, you know i you know he's related to you or, or yeah. you know he's a and he's he's one of your best friends and i i just don't feel good about that he could say I, i'm i'm not at peace with that and that name would be tabled or it would be yeah. eliminated from discussion just as any other person could yeah. do. And if, and if in discussion that somebody says, well, can you tell me why? It seems like, you know, everybody likes him and th th there's these issues. Can you tell me why we wouldn't consider? Uh, I, I'm just a little concerned that there may be too close of a relationship and we need some diversity. I know? also mean an absence of elders. So let's say there's something going forward within the vision of the house. Like he want, you guys may be planning to do a building where he wanted to push something forward through beyond the elders. There's no vetoing power in that sense, or is there the, the capacity to veto? Uh, no, there, there's no vetoing because it's all you. you, you know. That's what I wanted to make sure. Just yeah. wasn't sure. Yeah. I've been a part of cultures that were similar in that, but they had moments where they were allowed if they felt like there was something they had to go with their gun on. Yeah. So, yeah. That makes sense. Okay, are we are we out of time? Yeah. Okay. I I have I have notes of what I've been yes. talking out of that I will make available to the Radiant uh, staff so you can uh, you can get them from the website or whatever however we we would do it make it there and uh, and it is mine. It is mine.